I'm the district superintendent, and we apologize for calling you in on the nicest day of the year thus far. So we'll move it along because uh, apparently spring's just about over with the forecast coming in for later this week. So and we thought we were done worrying about snow days. Huh? Yeah. All right, um, tonight uh, we have um, some very special guests. So let's let's get started. We're gonna we're gonna start with Alpine Ski. So our first student to be recognized tonight represented the district at the state level in alpine ski. She wasn't able to make it last month when her Nordic ski companions were here being recognized as she was traveling to Colorado to participate in the USSA Junior Ski Championships. Maggie Blanding. So Maggie earned all state honors uh, on the Al Al alpine ski team and placed 14th at state. Head coach, Fred Fern. All right, yep, we'll do a picture. Join the group. Or Yes, May, uh, do we have Maggie's parents in attendance tonight or other family members? Maggie's uh, parents? Oh, busy. She's standing. Thank you. So a round of applause for Thank you, Ken. All right, next we will recognize students who represented the district in the state wrestling tournament. Uh, Luke Parzik. <laughs> Matt Sloan. <laughs> TJ Turinsky. <laughs> and head coach Craig Nasvik. All right, a couple other things. So Luke took third place and was all state. Congratulations, Luke. And uh, uh, one more thing. The Minnesota Wrestling Coaches Association proudly recognizes White Bear Lake as a gold academic team for achieving a GPA of 3.6 for the 2018-19 wrestling season. If the parents or other family members in attendance, if you would please stand, be recognized. Thank you. All 
right, our next group played in the boys hockey tournament back in March after winning a well-fought section game versus Hill Murray. So uh, Luke Ailes. <laughs> Cooper Anderson. Uh, Chase Bill, is that? Carter Collins, Evan Foss, Joey Fratellone, Grant Hofeld. Tristan Johnson, Jake Klein, Zach Cuyaba, Tyler McKenzie, Blake Meister, Spencer Millard, Ethan Mork, Sam Newpower, Brady O'Brien, Leighton Road, Billy Rose, Tyler Steffens. Sam Verkirke, <laughs> Student Manager Gabe Bartlett, <laughs> Student Manager Bella Bill, <laughs> Student Manager Lauren Johnson, <laughs> Student Manager Sydney Cuyaba, Chris Anderson, assistant coach. Sean Padden, assistant coach. And head coach, Tim Sager. All right, this will be a big crowd. A lot of large okay, people. Maybe, <laughs> maybe we should okay. just. Parents and family members, if you're in attendance, would you please stand and be recognized? Thank you for all your support.
All right, our final group to be recognized this evening is a group of middle school and high school students who are recognized in the Scholastic Art Awards program. Congratulations to the following students. Uh, Mia Binsfeld. She earned two gold keys. Um, Malin Eck, honorable mention. Lucy Fleming. All right, Lucy earned two gold keys and she got a national silver key, one of only three middle school entries in Minnesota and the only sculpture in Minnesota to earn that distinction. Okay, Charlotte Kelly, the silver key. Um, Alicia Q, silver key. Eldoria Lilo, silver key. Maddie McDaniel, a gold key. Brock Moore, honorable mention. Meg Peterson, two silver keys and two gold keys. And Molly Vadness, a teacher. And I... All right, from Sunrise Park Middle School. Celia Furman, honorable mention. Christina Pratt, honorable mention. And teacher Margaret Jacoblich. From White Bear Lake Area High School, Devin Close, honorable mention and gold key. Looks like we will just read through the list, okay? Um, we can hold the applause for this group until the end, being none of them are here. Annika Dahl, two silver keys. Uh, Riley uh, Ebert, honorable mention. Rebecca Lilo, gold key. Lauren Martin, honorable mention. And Sean Gritzmacher is the teacher of that crew. So. Come on back over. All right, congratulations. Thank you. <clears throat> Par uh, parents and family members, please stand and be recognized. Parents and family members of that group. I think some of you are here. Thank you for your support. <clears throat> All right, that concludes our um, awards ceremony tonight, uh, or our recognition ceremony tonight. I see a lot of cookies on the back table, so there's lots of young folks here who probably need a little snack to ruin dinner plans. Please, uh, please grab one on your way out. And that concludes our, our event. Regular board meeting starts at 7. Thank you all for coming. School board meeting of Independent School District 624. Uh, would the clerk please read the roll? Beloit? Here. Chapman? Here. Allison? Here. Fahey? Here. Mullen? 
Absent. Newmaster? Here. Wilson? Here. And now would you join us in saying the Pledge of the Allegiance? Pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, we have uh, uh, an agenda before us. Uh, do I hear a motion to approve the agenda? So moved. Second. Okay. Is there, do we do any discussion? Any discussion on this? No. Okay. All right. Uh, so those in favor, say aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. And we have an agenda. Okay. This, uh, then we move on to the consent agenda. This is the uh, portion of the meeting where if uh, there are any concerned citizens that they can address the board. Uh, in order to do so, you'd need to fill out a, an index card. Oh, I'm sorry, consent yeah. agenda, sorry. Consent agenda. Yep, okay, you got that goofed up here, but uh, consent agenda, um, do I have a motion, hear a motion to approve that? So moved. And a second? Second. Okay, any discussion? Okay, all, uh, or we need a voice no. vote. Roll. Okay, roll call vote. Um, Beloyed? Aye. Chapman? Aye. Ellison? Aye. Fahey? Aye. Newmaster? Aye. Wilson? Aye. Okay. Then we move on to public forum. <laughs> um, and as I was uh, starting to say earlier, if, uh, if there's anybody that wants to speak to the board, if uh, uh, you would like to do so, you'd need to fill out a, a card um, that's over there, a white index card. I haven't seen any here. Uh, is there anybody in the audience that would like to address the board? Okay, seeing none, we will move on. Okay, and then the uh, first item, uh, information item, is the NYFS presentation. All right, I'd like to welcome um, Mr. Jerry Hermatka. He's the president and CEO of uh, Northeast Youth and Family Services. He's with us tonight to, to share some information about the wonderful organization that he, that he heads up. So I'll just turn it over to you, Jerry, and Wonderful. welcome. Thank you, thank you. Good evening. Uh, this yeah. is new for us. We usually do a lot of presentations to our partners in the municipalities, and we had a discussion with one of your members, and they said, you know, you really should come and just let us know what you guys are all about. So that's what we're here for tonight, is okay. just to let you know what we're all about here. Welcome. And I guess I get to run the machine. Oh, this is gonna be fun. You guys are in trouble, I'll tell you. <laughs> Does that work? There? Which one do I push, you guys? There it is, okay. I was pushing the wrong one. Okay, um, so I like to start off with a quote. Uh, and the quote I chose for tonight is, someone is sitting in the shade because someone planted a tree a long time ago. I've heard a number of people this is attributed to, but the one that most recently is from Warren Buffett. Uh, the reason I chose this is because this is really the way that we look at the folks that we work with. Uh, we work with youth and families and adults, and it's really about helping them be successful now, especially with kids, and getting them ready down the road. Um, but we also do this because this is kind of where we are as an organization. We've been around for 42 years, and there's a lot of folks that have been before us that have helped us get to the place where we are today. Uh, when we started, we had four staff and served 100 folks. Today, we've got 49 staff, and we serve about 4,000. So um, somebody planted a tree a long time ago for us to be here. So I'm going to just help you understand about us. Um, uh, the, we have an interesting story, and I just have to go there because it really sets the stage for who we are. Um, we got started when 10 municipalities and the school, local, school, local school districts and faith communities came together and they got a matching grant from the Law Enforcement Assistance Administration to work with kids that were in trouble with the law. At that time, uh, if you were in trouble with the law, uh, you were handcuffed, thrown in the back of a police car and taken downtown St. Paul and you were in holding until your court date came up. And so this was a way when the federal government and the local officials were saying, there's got to be a different way that we're working with kids. The reason I say that is because 42 years later, nine of those original 10 municipalities still support us and have supported us every year. And it's this partnership that's really part of our DNA. 
uh, they can be on our board of directors as a result of that, which is unheard of. And so this partnership extends now to the school districts. We work w very closely with four school districts, White Bear Lake being one of those, and that's what we want to talk about tonight is how do we work with you folks and partner with you to try and serve the youth and seniors and adults uh, in our community. <clears throat> I don't know if this looks familiar to you at all, uh, but we borrow this from education. This is the three tiers of services. Um, we use it when we talk about who is for our services. Um, general population in an educational setting, those are the ones that can benefit just from normal instruction. You know about the special services and the intense services. With our mental health and our youth development programs, we work with mostly the, the 20%. Those are the folks that we're trying to give the skills and fortitude to, to be able to be ready to, to generally be part of the regular population. But we also work with the regular population because that's where we get a lot of volunteers. We have a senior chore program that we run, and we have over 600 volunteers that help us out with that over the course of the year. So we're working with all different levels of the population. Let me just talk about our mental health, our programs here, if I can. Um, mental health is a big part of what we are. Um, we are what's called a Rule 29 clinic, which means that we're sanctioned by the state to be at a certain level of degree of, of services that we offer. What's important about that is we talk about this in a solution-oriented. And even though it's just words, it really makes a difference. Rather than sitting down with someone who comes in for services and says, so what's your problem? Uh, we, how do you want it to be? You know, what are your goals? What are your hopes? What would you like it? And, and even though that's just words, it really does make a difference. I remember when I started a long time ago working with that and working with a mom and a child and saying to the mom, so what's the problem? And she went, Junior, you know, just fix Junior and we'll be all right. And I was working with couples and I'd go, so what brings you here today? And they'd go, just fix the other one, you know? So it, it's a difference when you start saying, how would you like it to be? And again, that parent that I was working with, after, how would you like it to be? And she started talking about Junior in about three sentences, then she was telling me all the problems. And I stopped her. After about the third or fourth time, she said, you know, I've been stuck in this for so long, I don't think I even know how I want it to be. And that's when I realized, and that's where the industry has really gone, let's help people talk about how they want it to be. The barriers will come up, but let's talk about it in a positive sense. So that's what we mean by solution-oriented. The other thing that's really important for us is this whole thing about trauma, and we're even now starting to call it resilience. Um, quickly, uh, and I, there's three types of trauma that we now can identify. There's the one that we're most used to, the PTSD that we know with our, our uh, armed forces that come back from battle. Everybody's familiar with that one. The other one that we now know is the one that happens from those one-time events. I mean, people that went through that horrible disaster in Houston or in um, you know, Dominican Republic or, you know, tornadoes or deaths or whatever, uh, fires, that's another way that people carry with them the, the trauma and that experience. The third one that we've finally been able to understand with children is the one that probably plays the most for us. Uh, there are people that are a lot smarter than us who now can measure the brain and look at the brain, how it works. And what they're seeing is that people that go through what are called um, traumatic experiences, um, their brain just doesn't develop. To the, they're to the point where you just can't, as they told me when I was a kid, sit down in your seat, put your elbows on your desk, and let's learn, okay? Kids just can't do that. And so what we're trying to do is we're trying to work with those folks to develop the skills so that they can be present in the moment. Um, School-based, and this is where it comes with you here, uh, we have two clinics. One is in Shoreview, the other one is here in, North, uh, in White Bear Lake. Uh, but what we also do is we also provide therapists in buildings. And I don't know if you're aware of this or not, but we have therapists that partner with four of your school, dis school buildings, North, South, Sunnyside, and Central. And the therapists are there to do this. One main thing, and that's remove barriers. Access to services is one thing that gets in the way from people getting mental health services. The other thing is the cost. And we get a grant, uh, we're part of um, 70 different organizations throughout the state. The state is saying, let's provide services in the school setting. Their goal is to have mental health in all school buildings. We partner with others to provide services in Ramsey County. Um, and what we're doing with that is we're really trying to be there and help. We also are there for staff. We're there to be able to give guidance to staff. We're there to do training. We're there to help staff understand, is this an issue that really is mental health or is this just an issue of, that we can deal with on a regular basis? Talking about this embedded and based and linked, this, I'm taking into the weeds a little bit here, but I just I need to help you understand this. Um, on this continuum of services with the schools, at one end, in the middle is this based. We have therapists that are in your buildings. We're there to work with staff. We're there to meet with kids um, to provide services. 
Embedded is a little bit more where some school districts and some school buildings say, we'd really like you to be more part of our staff. We'd like you to help out in consultation. We'd like you to help out in training. We'd like you to help out in being in the environment. And so that's what this embedded is about. On the other end, that is a school linked. In our clinics, we have folks that come for services. And as we talk with the families, they will talk about issues involved in school. And we can say to them, do you want us to be a bridge or a link and work with the schools around your child? And some will say yes. And others will say, no, please don't let anybody know we're here. Okay, This is just very private for us. So this whole continuum of embedded, based, and linked is where we're trying to provide services so that, again, students are ready to learn. Clinic-based, already talked about that. All that essential community provider means is that we've got a special designation saying we'll work with people regardless. We'll try and work with folks regardless of the ability to pay. And day treatment, this is for kids that are, have gone through regular services who are still having difficulty um, being successful in the classroom, in a home, in the community. This is like hardcore. This is every day, all day. Half the day is educational support. Half the day is therapy, year round. Uh, the kids that aren't with us are kids that end up to be hospitalized. And what we hear from those folks that provide hospitalization is our job is to kind of get them back on the road, but your job in the community is to help take them down the road. So between the clinic, the school-based, and the day treatment, it is the mental health services that we provide. Okay? Quickly, there's the other side of us, and we call these community services. Um, and we talk about in terms of youth development, and to us, capital Y, capital D means something. Youth development means that we are working with giving kids meaningful experiences, that they're involved in decisions about what it is that affect them in terms of programming, and that there's a meaningful relationship with a good, what I like to call, um, nutritious adult. Um, it's different than mental health, it's different than education, but it is still a focus of how we work with kids. What we're trying to do with that is, as you can see there, academics, employment, life skills, and citizenship. We know, and you know, I'm just preaching to the choir here, you've got to have an education today. You don't have a high school degree. It's not like my dad that had a sixth grade education and had six kids with my mom, and they did quite well. That was a whole different era. And today, you need an education, and you need more than just the high school. It's not that we provide academics. We think that we help kids get ready to learn. We help kids look at employment. I'll talk about in just a moment about early time jobs. Life skills is how do you manage yourself in a group setting or with others. And citizenship is the whole thing about being part of something bigger than yourself. Diversion, that's how we got started. And I just want to talk about it because we work closely with your school resource officers with referrals that come from the school or with kids that are referred for other issues and we work with the school resource officers. There's a difference between public safety and restorative justice. We still have some people that say, you know, you're just being too soft in these kids. You know, make it tough and then they won't want to get in trouble again. Um, the other side of it is how do we help kids learn uh, new ways to do things and how do we still say you crossed the line. You did something that was illegal. You can't do that. But let's get you connected to something positive. And you know what? While we're doing it, let's make sure that you say I'm sorry and you repair any damage that you have with those that you offended. Sometimes it's the community. We had a situation where there were a bunch of kids that graffitied the side of the building and talking with the owner. He said, you know, I had trouble when I was growing up. You know, if you get the kids to do some paint and come down, I'll paint the building with them. That's the type of stuff that we're trying to do is connect kids with positive things. So that's the difference between public safety and restorative justice. The just say yes. Uh, I don't know if you can remember those days of just say no. Do you remember that? Just say no didn't work because we didn't help kids say yes to something positive. And so what we're trying to do with kids is we're trying to help them see, what are your interests? What do you want to be when you grow up? I don't know what I want to be. Well, then let's look at employment and let's look at your life skills and see what you're interested in. What we're seeing right now is a whole group of kids that are coming through our diversion program that fall into one of two categories. One is about a third of the kids that come through is what I call dumb decisions. Wrong place, wrong time, being an adolescent, OK? If I was growing up and I would have had diversion, I probably would have gone through diversion when I was growing up. Dumb decisions, OK? The other part that we're a little more worried about are these two-thirds that I call adolescent angst. They are mad at the world, and we've got to figure out why. And so whenever we get a referral, what diversion means is you can either go through the court system or you can be diverted and work on the community level. It's your choice. Um, and we get about 99% of the families that say, we'd rather work with you than to go to the courts. Um, and so when we do that, the first thing we want to do is we want to meet with the youth and the adults 
parent, parents, guardian, grandparents, whatever in their lives, and let's, again, help them understand, yeah, cross the line, but let's see what they're interested in. And just quickly, we, we do a little piece as we're doing this intake with the family. We have the kid read something. At one point, this kid's reading something, and he's about three sentences into it, and he throws the thing down on the table and just shuts down. And his mom kind of gives that look like, I've seen this before. And so as we started talking with the kid about it, what it was is that he doesn't read well enough that he feels comfortable in a classroom setting to be part of the classroom. So we started switching it. Rather than saying, well, read the rest of that, we said, well, what are you good at? Well, he likes working with his hands. Okay, so what can we do in the school? Long story short, he liked working with his hands. We connected him with the theater department. He started doing props behind the scenes. He had a way to connect to the school. He felt good about it. He got him involved, and that got him down the road. That's that piece of connecting kids to something positive so that the other pieces can come in place. Our senior chore program is on the other end of the continuum. And we work real closely with your community ed folks doing a senior chore program. Uh, again, we know our communities are aging. 80% of people in our households in our service area do not have school-aged children. State is 73%. People want to age in their homes. They want to stay there. So how do we help it? So senior chore helps seniors age in their home. We get money from a number of places to do that. But what we do is we are the last chore program in the metro area that connects youth with seniors. 14, 15, 16 year olds, as well as adults that go in and do those routine jobs that seniors can't do. And what we find when it works, what we find when it works is there's this intergenerational. Uh, I can remember a woman one time calling me, Mrs. Johnson. Mrs. Johnson called and said, you know, I've been talking with Jerry and he's, he seemed to be having some trouble in school. Can I talk to him about that? No, well yes, of course. That's another person in that life that is supportive of this kid and is showing interest in him. Back to what youth development is, meaningful involvement, involved in what's doing to you, and good adults around you. And that's where the senior chore program is helping seniors age in place. It's an employment program for kids, a first time job. We also have adults there. And when it works, and when it works, it's this intergenerational part. I'm not gonna talk a lot about the out of school program. We used to have a much larger one. We used to run a thrift store. We used to do a lot with uh, mentors and all. The money for this has shrunk. The money for out-of-school time programs for youth has shrunk. Um, and right now we have one program they're doing with uh, Roseville Middle School, um, and I'll just leave it at that. It's a 21st century thing trying to help kids uh, improve their grades, develop leadership, and life skills. Okay? So between the two, between our mental health and our community service programs, that's how we serve 4,000 people. Let me get, take you down the weeds a little bit here. So here's our budget. It's about $3.3 million. Uh, right after the recession, we were pushing about $5 million. We had a major program that we were doing with a bunch of different school districts. The money changed for that. The contract changed for that. And we leveled off about six years ago at $3 million, And that's where we've been since then. It kind of fluctuates up and down. If you take the green, the red, and the blue, our day treatment, our community services, and our mental health, it's about 75% of our budget. You might look at it there, the colors, the brown, that 5% is building. You might say, well, why do you have a budget just for building? In Shoreview, we own the building that we office in. Our board 20 years ago was foresight enough to say, rather than renting from people, let's buy the building and we are actually a landlord and we lease out a couple floors. And we hear for nonprofits, find a variety of ways to get money these days. Don't just rely on contributions and on grants. And that's part of what we do with that. Quickly about this, this is how we've changed as an organization. If I were to look at 2013, 12, and whatever, you would see the red, which is a contract, even more. We used to be what we would call a contract-dependent organization. A contract works like this. They say, we're going to give you X number of dollars. You say you're going to work with X number of people, and as you provide the service, we reimburse you. It's the basic capitalistic model, and that's fine. What nonprofits have had to learn how to do is deal with that. So, for instance, over the winter, before February came and we had a lot of snow, there wasn't any snow. So the kids that were going out and shoveling for the seniors to make money, there wasn't any snow to shovel. So that's the piece about contracts is that you can't always predict and control when services are provided. It's not like we can say we're going to go out and advertise for more kids that are in trouble with the law. Okay? So as the contracts have changed for us, our board said, we still got to provide services here. How are we going to do this? And that's when we started doing more fee-based. The program that used to be with the district, school districts up here doing that type of day treatment, we went off and we did our own. 
Uh, it's called Northeast Educational Therapeutic Services. Um, right after the recession, there were about 15 organizations in the metro area that provide it. Right now, there's about five. And we get kids from our main area, but we get kids from as far away as Hastings and Forest Lake because there just aren't programs for these types of kids that need these services. The difference between a grant and a contract, a grant says we'll give you X number of dollars, you provide services to X number of people, tell us what you did with it. That's what we really like. And we've got back to those municipalities. We now have 15 municipalities that support us. They give us a grant. We guarantee that their residents can have mental health, senior chore, and diversion services regardless. We always work with people so that they have to pay something. Otherwise, if you don't pay for it, you don't have any investment in it. Uh, but it's the piece that we do in terms of balancing out contracts and grants and contributions are a piece that we need to do better at. Because we were a contract dependent organization, we didn't have to raise money. The times have changed and our board now knows that and we're working closely to become an organization that has it woven through our culture and with our volunteers. Can I keep going or do I need to stop? I know I get a little wind. Keep going? Okay, keep going. Okay. So here's what I would say when I meet with the municipalities, and I think this still applies to you folks, is so what, Hermatka? So you do all this great stuff, so what difference does it make? First of all, that whole thing about services for residents are assured. Back to the school base, the state says you've got to give services regardless of their ability to pay. Right now, through the first three quarters of the school year, we've given out about $60,000 in services. Uh, for folks that can't afford it, they either don't have insurance, they've lost insurance, they're in the middle of getting insurance, or they've got a high deductible or a high copay, and we help them out with that. We were budgeted for 35000 But because of our relationship with the state, we just have to continue to do that, and that's how we raise money from the schools and other places to help offset that. In terms of benefits, we don't educate people, but we think we help people get ready to be educated. And again, we're trying to remove barriers for folks so that they can be in the classroom and so they can benefit from that. And sometimes we hear people say, well, you know, my kid's fine. Yeah, but if the kid next to your kid isn't fine and is affecting the whole classroom, it can have an impact on your kids. So we really believe about this whole thing of educational attainment. Effective workforce is not only those first time jobs for kids, but what we hear from parents is, if I don't have to worry about my family or myself when I'm at work, I can be more productive. And that's what we're hearing here is for every dollar that we put into mental health services, an employer can see about 180 bucks in return. Citizenship I've already talked about. It's being part of something bigger than yourself. You know, we still get criticized because our community service is positive. We still have people to say, give them a toothbrush and go have them clean up the street because if they got to scrub the street, they aren't going to like it and they aren't going to want to do it again. No, our community service is getting them involved in positive things. I already talked about the one with the kid that was working with the theater. That was his community service. That was getting him connected to something. Reduced cost to the public. Uh, <laughs> I've been doing this for a while. And uh, we used to go way back when, when we were kind of full of ourselves, we could save kids. We don't need parents. We don't need teachers. We were kind of awkward of our own adolescence. And those of us who realize you're part of community, Hermotka, you got to engage parents and teachers and everybody else survived. The rest of them burned out and they went somewhere else. But, what we used to say way back then is like, God, if we just save one kid, it's worth it. Well, those days have changed. Now we're talking about things like investments, social return on your investment. Uh, you know, and again, I already quoted the one about mental health. There's the one about, as you folks know, every dollar that you put into early childhood education, you get five, six bucks back. Every dollar that you put into youth development, you get about eight bucks back. Every dollar that you put in, I mean, it's all of those pieces. And so that's what we're saying is, one, it's an investment in our public. But what we also, when we talk to the county, what they say is, if you can work with them in the community and do early intervention and prevention, they may not get to us where we have to do deep end services. So it's a way that we're investing early into what we're doing so that we aren't getting it. 50% of all adults that have mental health issues had an origination in adolescence. 50% of all adults that have mental health issues, it started in adolescence. So let's start there. So that's what this is about, reduced cost to public. Leveraging outside resources, we have to match monies. And many times, I was just looking at a grant today from the state. For every dollar you get from the state, you've got to match it with a buck. How do we do that? That goes back to those grants. And finally, the one that I don't put up here, and this is the one that I really believe in as we are this organization that works with 15 municipalities and four school districts and everybody is, issues don't stop at borders. Your school district, when I was trying to get ready for it, I'm going to show it in a minute here, is comprised of many different municipalities. 
It's not just white bear, it's Vadness, it's Hugo, it's whatever, and the same thing that goes across. So we're trying to work across boundaries. So let's just get into some numbers here. Uh, I did my best to pull out 2017 and 2018. So they're school-based, and if you see that number, don't think of individuals, think of that as households. Because whenever we meet with a youth, we meet with the parent, or parents, or guardian, or whatever. So there were 78 households that got school-based services in 2017 for a value of 104 grand. 2018, there's 60 households. But look at the number. Less households, but more money. What we're seeing is more people coming with more entrenched and complex and difficult issues that need more help. Okay? Clinic-based, 186 were served through our clinic in White Bear, serving the folks that I think the students and families that go to your schools. 2018, 121, and we're going, what the heck happened there? There's a pattern in mental health. Uh, we live in Minnesota, and in the summer, you know, people don't need as much mental health. <laughs> School's out of session, sun's shiny, people are busy, and then it starts building up in school, and then it gets into the fall, and then they have a little bit of a break over Christmas, and then boom, it just takes off again. We didn't have that increase in the fall. And we're talking with others to go, what's going on here? And we're not sure whether it is, back to that insurance question, that that's changing, whether it's things in our community, we don't see that it's us, people are still coming to us. What we're seeing now, if anything, is what usually happened in November and December is now happening in February and March. Something's going on in the industry and we've got to figure that out. Because that's dramatic. That's, that scares me when I see that pattern. Day treatment has an interesting as well. This is that expensive program. Look at that. One kid. One kid for 38 grand. And yet that's cheaper than hospitalization. That's how scary that is. Two kids for 33 grand, we're looking into that, and the pattern we're seeing here is it takes us a while to do everything that we have to do, kind of like when you put together a special education um, uh, report IEP. You got a lot of work you got to do to get that IEP. Well, we have our things we call diagnostic assessments. We get the parent in, we get the kid in, we do all this. What we're seeing is that the kids and the families are so stressed, they can't continue to follow through. We've had two kids for 33 grand. Last year we had one kid for 38. This revolving door is happening. We've got to figure out what we're going to do about that because they need the services, but they're so stressed they can't even get to our services. Diversion is about the same, okay? Again, referrals from school resource officers, referrals from the uh, Ramsey County uh, Attorney's Office. We've even started some stuff with schools now. If schools have said, hey, you know, we've identified some kids that there's something going on here and it really isn't chargeable, but can we work with you? And we go, if the parents want to, we'll work with you on that. It's that early intervention, early prevention. There's the senior chore, the 60 seniors and five kids. And these are just the kids that are working, uh, 52 and 10. Look at the dollar up there. Uh, Seniors need more services to stay in their homes than they did before. It's continuing to grow, and we're a little bit scared about where that's going. This doesn't talk about your girls lacrosse team that volunteers for us in the spring and the fall to help out with our spring cleanups, or it doesn't help talk about the National Honor Society kids that volunteer with us. That's part of those four to six, 800 volunteers a year that we have. A great one right over here of Caldwell Banker Barnett Realty. Um, Chuck and his group, they started off a few years ago volunteering for us, and now they look forward to it. It's a team builder. And I don't know if you saw in the newspaper a few days ago, uh, businesses are starting to say, our workers are going, yeah, this is a great place to live, but what are we doing to make this a good community? And that's what we're starting to see here is people want to volunteer and we're an option for them. So back to it, 2017, 447 households, 350 grand, 359, almost 80 less, but yet only 10,000 less. And that's what we're seeing is our services are needed more than ever. And we've got to continue to be creative and innovative about how we can make sure those services are available. Let me do a couple just quick, full thing, quick things here. Uh, cultural shifts, mindfulness. Uh, what mindfulness is, um, the best example, I don't know if any of you have been on a vacation recently or if you've been um, on a beach recently and you see someone clicking on their phone, a good friend of mine's on vacation with his wife and he's on his phone and she goes, what the heck are you doing? He goes, well, I gotta check in the office. She goes, you're on vacation, turn off your phone. Mindfulness <coughs> is about being in the moment at the time. And what we're seeing is mindfulness, our, our workers in America are stressed folks, you know this, and people are you know, plugged in constantly and whatever and mindfulness is what we're talking with is how do we help people be in the moment? This plays out in truancy, I mean truancy and trauma. We had a family come in for services. We're trying to do a better job of getting insurance, just like you do when you go to the doctor's office. Can I see your insurance card, please? You know this whole routine. As our receptionist is asking for the insurance, 
the dad loses it, cussing and swearing and pounding and everything. And we're talking to the receptionist afterwards. She goes, all I did was ask for his insurance card. What she ran into was all of the trauma that he lives with every day that bubbled up and came up in that moment. It wasn't what was going on in the moment. It was all the things before. So mindfulness is just one piece that we're working with in terms of a technique to work with people that are in trauma. And I think you see this in the classroom, too. Kids that are having a hard time being in the moment. What are the things they're bringing into the classroom? Okay? Connectedness is a big piece that we're seeing. I already talked about the kids that are those two-thirds that I call adolescent angst. When we're talking to them, what we're seeing is that for a portion of those, they are connected to nothing. They're not connected to after-school activities. They're not doing well in school. They don't feel connected in school. They don't feel connected in the community. These are the ones that we hear about. Social media is horrible. Yeah, they are in their basement, and all they're doing is connected to social media. And when we talk to youth that are on our board, they say what's more damaging about it is those kids then look on social media and see their peers climbing Kilimanjaro and saving the world, and they go, boy, I really must be adult if I'm not doing that. Social media is an issue, okay? But what we got to do is we got to start looking at connectedness, and we're starting a new program now. But the other part of connectedness is seniors. We're helping seniors age in their homes. Once they don't have transportation, there's this isolation factor. And it, it's, it's Mrs. Olson who called us three years ago around Christmas. She said, I don't know what's wrong with me. You know, my husband died about this time three years ago, and my best friend died this fall, and, and I just, I can't get out of bed in the morning. I, you know, I don't want to eat. You know, I, what's wrong with me? Maybe I need to check into St. Joe's emergency room. St. Joe's does not want Mrs. Olson emergency room because she's isolated and she's alone. We're running into that with our, day, with our um, senior chore program. We've got to find a way to deal with it. And what I'm looking at is, hmm, we've already got kids that are going into their homes. And we had a doctor a few years ago said, I got a new computer. You got a kid who can show me how to use it? How could we have kids help seniors learn how to do Skyping and develop a network? And that's where we've been talking with your folks over at your Senior Resource Center, because even those are changing a little bit. Funding, if you've been following that with United Way, United Way went from $100 million four years ago to $70 million. They cut out um, senior resource centers and they cut out Meals on Wheels. So we got to find a new way to connect seniors. And maybe it is through technology. I don't know. We'll see. Industry, uh, people are so happy they got low unemployment. I'm scared. Uh, this summer was the first time that I read somewhere we've got more open jo jobs than we have people. That scares me. Goes back to that thing, if we just save one kid, we need them all. <laughs> we can't afford not to have any kid because we need everyone to help us. So I, you're seeing as well, I'm curious, my, I married into an education educator family. You guys are feeling well. Where are you getting your teachers and where are you getting your qualified teachers and all that's going on with that? We're seeing it in mental health. At a time when the stigma to receive mental health services is on the decline, the number of folks that are getting into mental health, especially the kind that we do, not that you sit in your office somewhere, but you go into a school. Do you know how spooky that is for therapists, therapists to go into a school? Avis, is it spooky? She's one of our people that we connect with. We call them mental health ready schools and therapists that can do that. It's a whole other skill set. We've had great therapists that say, I don't want to do school-based anymore. Just let me sit in my office and wait for people to come to me rather than me go to them. At a time when mental health is on increase, we are competing for therapists because there are less getting into it and there are less that want to do the kind we have. Finally, then, with 21st century skills, you guys are hearing all this all the time, but here's what I'm showing the, and I don't mean this as an insult, please, but this is what I'm showing the cities as I go around. We used to prepare folks for these kind of jobs wrote and memory. I mean, some of you might remember multiplication tables. I remember multiplication tables. I was pretty good at multiplication tables because I could memorize them, okay? What we really need to be doing now is not multiplication tables, but we got to help kids get ready for this. Uh, there's that, that statistic out that like 30% of all jobs that kids go to college for aren't even there when they start college. You know, it's changing so much. How do we do that? And it's this whole list, and I'm not going to get in. I'm preaching to the choir again. It's 21st century skills. What I want to say is SEL, social emotional learning. Social emotional learning, how do we help a kid be ready to be in a situation where they contribute to the environment, they benefit from the environment, they know how to take back from the environment, they can control their emotions, they're good at creativity, innovation, all that. That's what they're saying is we need those type of skills to go forward. Back to the information, media, and technology. Again, I run into people that go, well, we just got to get rid of all these cell phones and all this stuff. And I go, yeah, it's kind of like when we said, you know, those gas-powered engines, they won't work. I'm going to just stick with my horse and buggy. We can't go back. 
We can't get the genie in the bottle. Current research I said for a kid that spends two hours or less on screen time, it's all right. You get over two hours a day, that's when you run into issues. And sitting with our young adults and our family and we're talking about something one day, he's on the phone, you know, he's on his phone. And I'm going, Jared, can't you be with us? He goes, just wait a minute. Here's what the answer to the question was. No, 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 no. And he rattles off all this information. We're going, oh, well, thank you very much. It wasn't that he wasn't being part of the group. He was doing his research on the moment. If you know how to use your social media, you have access to wonderful things. That's what we got to help kids understand is how do you use that. Quickly, this is a list of our partnerships. This is what we've become starting way back 40 years ago. There's the 15 municipalities, that the four school districts. We also do a little bit of White Bear and Matamidi the collaborations of all sorts of rotaries and collaboratives and, and all those pieces. And when we do that, we try to be involved in it. And I ran into Tim earlier and he said, yeah, you look familiar. I said, God, you kind of look familiar too. Well, that's when we were on a task force together, putting together a thing about uh, job search fairs uh, around uh, medical industries. Collaborations, faith community, do a lot with them in different ways. And business has already talked about where businesses are saying we need to be part of the community. So let me just stop. I'm sorry, I've given you a lot of information. As somebody said, you know, Hermaki, you just got to learn how not to throw up on people, you know, so I apologize for that. Any questions, any comments, anything that I can help answer so that you've got a sense of who we are and how we partner with you folks? Any questions for Mr. Hermatka? I just have a comment. I just wanted to say I was glad to see citizenship included in the work that you do because I feel like that's a lot of times that's left out. And that's really important. And I would almost add that to the 21st century skills list of things that students need to know how to, how to do. Yeah. So thank yeah. you. Yeah, cool. Any other comments, questions? I think my comment is just it's a great presentation with lots packed mm -hmm. into it. Mm -hmm. But you've got a nice display PowerPoint that we can go back and look at. Thank you. Because I know it didn't all sink through. Yeah. And, and let me even. Thank you. Let me even invite myself to say we go out to the 15 municipalities once a year just to say, here's what we've been doing. And, and we don't do that with the school districts. And um, our chair met with Don Mullins, correct? Mm -hmm. And that's how this got to be. So if you want to blame somebody for why I'm here, blame it on Don and Joe, because they got together and said, you know, these people need to hear about this. Mm -hmm. And so let me just invite ourselves. We'd be more than willing to continue to come out on a yearly basis that works best for you to be able to give you an update and just let you know where we're at. Because uh, it takes a while for us to get to know our organization, new board members. OK? Yeah. I, I think the work that you guys do is phenomenal, and I'm, uh, I was actually invited by one of your board members, so I'll actually be there on May 4th. So oh, to the leadership to lunch. Oh, look at this. You, you just don't. <laughs> and I didn't pay her. This is not a lead, and I did not pay Deb to do this, okay? So these are two ways that we raise money. These are our two events. If I can, please, let me just finish with this, because we are in a bind. I'm just going to tell you right now. Things are changing, and we're in a bind. Our leadership lunch is at Midland Hills. I know that's way on the other side. It could be in Minneapolis. You know, it's over there. Um, but we pack it. 300 plus people come to it. And what has gotten to the point where we used to try and get warm bodies to fill chairs, we had a board member two years ago who didn't invite one of their friends who called up in mid-May and said, you forgot to tell me about the leadership lunch. And they were getting scolded because they weren't there. It has become a place to be. It's community. It, it's just really cool. It's not just about NYFS. It's about community. We literally have to tell the people, sit down, be quiet, or we're not getting out of here at 1 o'clock. And I'm pointing, not, not that it's Wayne, but he knows what it's about <laughs> having been there, okay? So that's the other one. In this area, we do the Taste of Northeast, and we hold it down to Vadnais Heights Commons, okay? So two fundraising pieces, yes. Dr. Newmaster. The only other thing, and I went from top to bottom, and maybe I missed it, but... Your contact information. Um, you know, I got I, way back in the beginning. Thank you. I, um, I got a little out. ahead of myself on the first slide. Um, NYFS.org is our website. So people who might be out there or anybody wants to know about us, it's the one of the best ways to get us. But just have the .org to the end. NYFS. Yep, NYFS.org. Okay. Google. You want to still come up here and talk to these folks? Should we let it go? I'll just okay. say thank you on behalf of you. Okay. not easy to follow uh, about six years ago no eight years ago I got appointed as a council member in Vadnais Heights to this board that meets at 730 in the morning I thought what did I do to these people that they're gonna send me to this board meeting at 730 in the morning and after about two meetings it was clear 
this is a great organization, easy to support. We currently have over 20 board members, not just elected officials, but residents like myself, who no longer are in city councils. And we truly care about the kids that we're helping. And we thank you for this opportunity to share the information. And if you ever want to come out and get a tour, I'm sure it can be arranged. You bet. But thank you again. And thank you for uh, all that uh, the Northeast Youth, Youth and Family Services does. I mean, it's pretty astounding, quite frankly. So thank you so much. Thank you. And, and I'll leave with this. If we didn't have kids and families and partners who allowed us to work with them, we, we would have gone by the way. So thank okay. you for the partnership and willing to partner with us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, and then uh, we turn to the superintendent's report, Dr. Kazmierczak. Thank you, Mr. Chapman, members of the board. <clears throat> Before this evening's meeting, the school board recognized students who represented the district in state level contests. Uh, so students represented um, Alpine Ski, Wrestling, Boys Hockey, and Scholastic Art Awards. Congratulations to these students and their families. And we had a packed room earlier um, this evening. The middle school musical production of Willy Wonka Jr. with participants from both Central and Sunrise Park will take place April 25th, 26th, and 27th. Tickets are available online at the district website. A limited number of free tickets are available at our senior program as well. A complete listing of the Springs district productions can be found on the district website. We have seven finalists for this year's White Bear Lake Teachers Association Teacher of the Year Award of Robert Anderson, South Campus in the ALC, an English language learner uh, instructor, Alex Carlson at South Campus, Social Studies in AVID, Caitlin Held, North Campus, Language Arts, Abby Kath, Lincoln Kindergarten, Megan Perry, Sunrise Park, Language Arts, Leah Sitka at Lincoln, fifth grade, and Julie Stonehouse at Onika with Media and Enrichment. The district's 2019 Teacher of the Year will be named at the Extravaganza event on April 25th at 4.30 p.m. at um, South Campus Theater. In April recognitions, we are celebrating a variety of recognitions this month. April is Poetry Month, Math and Statistics Awareness Month, Paraprofessional Appreciation Day was April 3rd, April 7th through 13th, National Library Week, April 7th through the 13th, Assistant Principals Week, April 9th, National Library Workers Day, <coughs> April 15th through the 19th, Public School Volunteer Week, April 21st through the 27th, Administrative Professionals Week, and April 24th, Administrative Professionals Day. With that, I'll turn it over to McKenna for our student liaison report. This, this March, Student Council held their annual Spring Showdown where 10 teams participated in different activities from slushy chug to hungry, hungry humans. I know that everybody that went had a great time. They also held a shoe drive where teams could get extra points if they brought in lightly used or new shoes for donating. National Honor Society members spent one Saturday and Sunday standing in local grocery stores promoting the kid packing event put on by the White Bear Lake Food Shelf. They were selling $5 bags filled with food for kids who need it on the weekends as they don't have school lunch. Thank you to those students who volunteered and the community members who donated. NHS also elected their new executive board for next year, so congratulations to Madison, Noel, Julia, and Matthew. Last week, the juniors were finally able to take their ACT provided by the school as their original date got snowed out. Lastly, as Dr. Kazmierczak said, the middle schoolers have been working really hard on their musical, Willy Wonka, which will be performed April 25th through the 27th, so make sure to buy a ticket before they sell out because it's going to be a great show. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, McKenna and Dr. Kazmierczak. And now we move into discussion items. And the uh, first item, the only item, uh, is the first reading of school board policies. And those are policy 403, discipline, suspension, and dismissal of school district employees. Policy 404, employment background checks. Policy 405, veterans preference. Policy 520, student surveys. And policy 602, organization of school calendar and school day. Um, just as a, a reminder, and for those that uh, aren't aware um, of the process, these policies go through the uh, 
uh, policy committee of the board both it's a combination of both the board and administrative staff and uh, they are reviewed um, uh, regularly some of them uh, many, many of them on an annual basis and these policies have been reviewed by the uh, the uh, committee and are recommended for approval but tonight again is just the first reading um, are there any questions relative to these uh, board policies at this point in time? I know the board has had them for a little bit now to review, and uh, so I'll, uh, if there's any questions, Dr. Kez, or Dr. <laughs> Newmaster. The only one that I, I was looking at and thinking, hmm, was the back mandated background checks, mm -hmm. and simply because I'm involved with a, a camp that has mandated background checks. We had an issue with people who are coming to teach international and getting background checks to our language camps. The background checks are in the language and then they have to be translated. And I was just curious if we'd thought about, we do get international teachers and the background check from Korea, I know, comes in Korean, and it's pretty impressive looking, but uh, none of us knew what it said. So I kind of wondered what you did with that. So that's question one. And question two was, um, what is the cost these days of doing a background check, and how does that impact our volunteers? So, <laughs> yes, I'll take the first question. And um, for that, that's one of the only occasions that we may rely on a third party source for a background check. However, generally, when we're working with international organizations in order to find volunteers, they're quite adept at being able to make sure that we get a translated version of whatever kind of a background check we'd be obtaining. So, um, in the past, I've not found that to be an issue to get that translated and to make sure that we've got a background check that's usable for our purposes. Um, and like I said, that's really the only foreseeable time that we'd rely on a third party background check. Um, I think with the number, I was just thinking with the number of languages spoken and people that you want to include so you have diverse volunteers, that that's something that at least we should think about so people feel welcome and it's not something that you know, it just made me think of it because we just about had to shut down a program last summer because we only, we didn't just have one, we had like 25. And that happens and then I started thinking as a language teacher about all the languages we have in this district that are spoken at home and the people that would volunteer. I don't know, I was just wondering how do we make it welcoming and inclusive and still make sure we protect our our kids so it's something at least I didn't see dealt with in the policy sure okay and then in regards to your second question um, the price of a background check varies greatly so we go well beyond what would be called for in just a regular BCA when we conduct a background check and so what the average cost of a background check um, could be is you know, maybe around twenty-five to thirty dollars. However, they can be as expensive as a hundred or a hundred and fifty dollars, um, as that happens. And that would depend on name changes, number of states and counties that one has resided in. So those are those kinds of factors. Um, in this district, we've really taken the stance that we don't. Um, intend to pass that on to our volunteers in a real substantial way. And so for the most part, um, the district is bearing the cost of those background checks for volunteers. So for that uh, cohort specifically. That, and that wasn't clear the way this is written. It looks as if all volunteers get a background check before they volunteer and the application form should come with a check. And so that there are some instances where that may happen, but generally we're providing the, the funding for those background checks for volunteers. So if this is a policy that we put out, we might want to have something so we don't discourage volunteers mm -hmm. sure. from a diverse background because we really want them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's certainly something that we can look at. I don't know that there's a <clears> sense <throat> that that's uh, taking place right now, but I 
don't know that there's any harm in making sure that it's clear that we have that uh, opportunity available, even though in some instances we may still require um, some payment, just regarding, a, a, depending on the type of volunteer service. So we could change the default there. Okay. Okay, are there any other questions or comments, uh, Ms. Fady? I just said I was looking at the, um, the last one, policy 602, the school calendar and day, and it has the, um, the new section on e-learning days because of legislation that was just signed. Um, and says that, you know, due to inclement weather, but then looking at it, um, if we do have an e-learning day, I think it's important for people to know that, you know, there needs to be accommodations for students without internet access at home, for digital device access for families without the technology. Plan must also provide accessible options for students with disabilities. And do we have something in place or will that be developed if we do have to use an e-learning day? This sets um, the stage so that we can develop all of what you're, develop what that. you're discussing. Yeah. So this has to be in place and Before. then we would work through um, a mm -hmm. plan to implement that. Yeah. And then mm -hmm. just the last one I wanted to point out too that included in the legislation is each student's teacher must be accessible both online and by telephone during normal school hours to assist students. And that obviously, um, in terms of some staff I know don't like to give their phone numbers to students, so does that mean they then go in and are actually physically in the building? So I, that's just another thing to think about also, because I know there are some um, staff that have no hesitation giving their phone number to students and others that are hesitant to do that. Um, so it's not an either or there, it's they have to be available both online and by telephone. And I just think that's important for people to know in terms of the policies that we have to abide by. We've had some, actually Mr. Mons is the one who had referenced this maybe from a prior district, um, but uh, the ability to reach someone by phone doesn't mean giving a home phone number, it means making sure that they have an office uh, number available, which could include a voicemail, even mm -hmm. a voicemail for them. Even voicemail and then you're checking your, okay. Well, and it may not be on that, at that particular instant it may be, you know. So I think there's some room to, again, these are all, these are all mm -hmm. details that have not been worked out. This is the first step in the process to, in order okay. to put something in place with e-learning days. So. Okay, because there's a does, lot of work to do between says, now and when you know, that would happen. By telephone during normal school hours. Mm -hmm. um, so you but could it pick up your voice. It doesn't, say it. it doesn't say you're available for a conversation Station. during school hours. Okay. So. And if I could interject, uh, this mm -hmm. that very question came up at the yeah. policy committee meeting. Okay. Um, and uh, the discussion centered around the fact that, like Dr. Kasmerchek mm -hmm. said, that. Uh, a lot of the details have to be worked out, mm -hmm. but um, not necessarily that somebody's going to have to mm -hmm. give out their their personal telephone number uh, okay. from a privacy standpoint. So, but then I think in terms of you know t people's interpretation, like may jump to that conclusion. So, right. mm -hmm. okay. the way it's written, the way it's written. Doctor Newmaster, I read through this too, and. I guess both as an educator and as a mom and um, looking at the houses that I'm familiar with in my neighborhood, a lot of people go to work even if it is a school day. So you've got the 13 year old and the two younger kids. I'm not sure how much of an e-learning day that works out to be. Plus, you know, we have other kids that go to New Horizon or massive daycare centers the elementary kids. So somewhere in here, I think we need a statement that says you're not penalized if you're not in a circumstance to participate fully in this. Because I, I don't yeah, think Yeah, I think everybody. we're getting beyond the intent mm -hmm. of the policy. Mm -hmm. I think we're going beyond the policy. I think we're, we're talking about then putting a plan to actually, um, you know, put together the administrative procedure for, for um, implementing the policy as it, as it is. So I don't, I, that level of detail, I don't know that we would necessarily put in, in, in this policy. We would be developing um, expectations around it, and that's when we would have those conversations. That, that would be part E that's on here? 
notifying parents and students. Mm -hmm. Right. Yep. And then you'd get into the weeds about. Correct. Yep. If you're an off the grid. Right. So those are all those are all great questions, and in fact, some of them came up during our policy discussion, our committee discussion. Um, we know that there's a lot of work to do between now and when we would launch this. So, but this is a necessary step in the process mm -hmm. to have this in policy. Any further questions, concerns regarding these policies or comments? Mr. Chapman, if I could just just oh, to respond sure. again to uh, Ms. Fahey's comment, uh, just to clarify, it is not our intent that teachers will give out their personal number on these days. We, there, are, there are certainly plans around that, and I think speaking to what Mr. Kazmierczak said, Dr. Kazmierczak, there are other districts that have gone before us that have already developed plans that have been approved by the state, so we can pick the best of those, and when we, when we go mm -hmm. to implement our plans, we're not starting from scratch here but it's not our intent that people would give out their home phone numbers okay. on those days. Yeah, I know I'm kind of jumping ahead, but when I was reading the policy, it was like just, okay, what is the plan gonna look? I'm just curious as to what the plan would look like. So, thanks. Okay, well then these policies will come up next month for uh, action. Now we jump to operational items, and the first item on the list is action on E3 grants from the White Bear Lake Area Educational Foundation and Dr. Kazbercheck. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chapman, members of the board. Um, the White Bear Lake Area Educational Foundation established the E3 grant to further White Bear Lake Area students' understanding and attitudes towards science, the outdoors, our community, and the world. Additional environmental learning opportunities can transform our students by endowing them with increased academic skills, civic and community leadership, environmental stewardship, and global awareness. The goal is to provide opportunities for the students in our district to become inspired and responsible environmental leaders. So the White Bear Lake Area Educational Foundation will fund uh, the following grants. It's the Prairie School Phase Two. It's an outdoor learning space at Otter Lake <laughs> Elementary and uh, it uh, adds to what uh, to the work that had already been started there and um, again i know we've uh, sung the praises of our wonderful foundation before here at, at our board meetings and this is another example of the tremendous support that they they provide to our our, our teachers and our students so um, you're asked tonight to uh, approve the e3 grant in the amount of four thousand dollars from the white bear lake area educational foundation Okay, and with that, is there a motion to approve the grants? So moved. Okay, Mr. Wilson, is there a second? Second. Okay, Dr. Newmaster, and is there any, are there any uh, questions or comments, discussion uh, regarding this item? Seeing none, uh, we'll do a roll call vote. Beloyd? Aye. Chapman? Aye. Ellison? Aye. Fahey? Aye. Newmaster? Aye. Wilson? Aye. Okay, and the vote passes. Uh, and then we move on to operational item two, which is action on acceptance of bid for 2019 roof replacement projects at ALC uh, Golf View, Hippodrome Ice Arena, Normandy Park, Sunrise Park Middle School, uh, partial, uh, Vadnais Heights Elementary School, partial, and Willow Lane Elementary School, and Mr. Wald. Thank you, Mr. Chapman, members of the board, Dr. Kazmierczak. In March of 2018, the board approved the sale of LTFM bonds, that's long-term facilities maintenance bonds, uh, for the total of $16.1 million. Uh, last summer, we used those bonds. Uh, we rebuilt tennis courts at Central Middle School. We did parking lot work at Bel Air and Normandy Park. And we did some renovation to the ceilings and some lighting work, plus some ADA enhancements at North Campus. Um, and tonight we're, we're working on phase two. You've already approved HVAC, HVAC work at Ottawa Lake that will be used in the long-term facilities maintenance bonds for this summer. And now we have six roofing projects tonight for your review and approval. Um, we'll also have uh, some very smaller projects that will be going on this summer. Uh, Dan Rozier. Our facilities supervisor is with us today if you have any questions for either of us. Okay, um, thank you. Before we move on, though, Dan's going to just explain a little bit of the process of how he prepares um, mm -hmm. our, our RFPs for projects like this. Hello, everyone. Welcome, Dan. Um, I just wanted to talk a little bit about how we 
how a project evolves. Um, these roof projects, we started back on the first day of school, actually. We finished up a roof project at Central. Uh, I walked through with our roofing engineer and our uh, roofing contractor who does roofing inspections on that day. And afterwards, we sat down and looked at our plan for this summer or the next summer. So things we looked at, age of our roofs uh, and the condition of our roofs. Our contractor, roofing contractors on our roof constantly. I, I was over at Willow today and they were up there doing some small repairs. So they really know our roofs. The ages of these roofs range uh, 25 years, between 25 and 30 years. And on these built up roof systems, you hope to get between 20 and 25 years. Anything over 25 years is considered a bonus. I think by doing roofing maintenance every spring, every summer, we can extend that a little bit and it's well worth the cost to try to extend it a few years like we've done. So uh, our meeting, after our meeting uh, after, on the first day of school, um, that's when the work begins. I work with uh, community services, uh, senior center, summer programming, and we try to nail down which buildings we can actually close. Doing a roof project is a pretty stinky job, sometimes messy. We don't want kids in the building when we're doing it. It's pretty disruptive. So while I'm working with them, uh, our roofing uh, engineer is starting to engineer our projects. They're detail by detail. They're writing specs and uh, really get it down to a T of what exactly we want, what we need done. And uh, that pretty much takes about three months by that time in February, we were able to put our projects out for bid, advertising in the White Bear Press. Our engineer contacts all the big hidden roofing companies. We decided with six projects, instead of bundling them all into one big project with one contractor, we wanted to split them up to try to get a little bit better pricing. Hopefully some of the smaller companies would pick off some of these smaller ones instead of having one, instead of just limiting them to the big guys. So. That was our reasoning for splitting them up into six projects. Um, after advertising, we have a pre-bid meeting before we have sealed bids due. And at that time, we uh, sit down with all the contractors that are expressed interest in bidding and who, who got plans. And we just go through the project school by school, detail by detail, answering any questions, making sure there wasn't any errors in the, in the specs or anything that they questioned that, that, that uh, would come up. So. Once everybody's on the same page, the bids are due a couple weeks later. We open them up, sealed bids, and uh, we end up with the low bidder. You see the bid sheets of who bid. We had six contractors bidding on our projects this year, which is a pretty good number for, for this number of projects. And that brings us today. Uh, we we uh, highlighted the low bid, and we're asking you to, to approve the low bidders. Okay, thank you. Uh, is there a motion for action on, uh, well, it's all moved, accepting the bid. Okay, Mr. Wilson, second, anyone? Second. Okay, Ms. Boyd. Uh, any discussion? Mr. Wilson. Dan, that was my very question, if we couldn't, you know, package them all together since, you know, the scope and, uh, is really the same work at each site. Obviously, you'd want your individual specifications for each roof. And it made sense that um, you know you would in, uh, include a possibility for smaller companies to participate going individually. But I was surprised when you said that um, it wouldn't lower the price if you offered a package. Is that you know actually really the case? It was just a hard determination to sell. Our engineer finally made the final decision, and she thought we'd we'd. Uh, we'd pretty much limit it to two or three roofing companies. And yeah, did. I mean, de facto, yeah. you got, you know, four going to McPhillips and two going to Central. Yeah, so. and these are big jobs. It's even for the big companies, it, they're, they're big jobs. So Central to me is well known, but McPhillips, are they a big? Outfit? They are a big company. We actually, uh, we haven't worked with them before. I guess they put the roof on Otter many, many years ago, and that roof's been holding up great. But uh, prior lake schools had uh, done a lot of work with McPhillips in the last few years, so I reached out to uh, their building operations director, and he uh, highly, he was uh, very uh, highly recommended McPhillips. So, and our engineer worked with him before too, and they were happy with him. Let the record show that uh, Mr. Rosner's answer was in uh, response to a question that Chairman Mullen would have asked had he been here, <laughs> if we'd ever done business with that company before. So, that's good to hear. Thank you. All right. Any other questions, discussion, comments? 
Okay, then let's uh, call a roll on it. <clears throat> Beloit? Aye. Chapman? Aye. Ellison? Aye. Fahey? Aye. Newmaster? Aye. Wilson? Aye. All right. And then we move on to um, the next item, which is school district population adjustment. And I believe Dr. Kazmierczyk, that's you. Thank you, Mr. Chapman, members of the board. So this is a, um, an agenda item that comes before you um, every few years. The last time we adjusted our population was back in 2016. So um, every 10 years there's a census and so you, you have end up with a district population and if you're a growing district, there's a mechanism for you to adjust your, um, your um, total population because there are certain things, certain funding sources that are tied to that. And so the way we do it in Minnesota is we work with the state demographer. The state demographer provides us with a, with a new number and then we take that number, present it to the school board, the school board certifies it which is what you're being asked to do tonight. And then the demographer uh, will um, work with the Minnesota Department of Education to get our, our new enrollment figure, our new uh, population uh, figure to them. And then they use that in our calculation for primarily our community education revenue. So, so the number before you, that's 66,647 is what uh, the state demographer's office gave us just uh, as uh, about a week ago. And that's up from our, the last time we did this, um, fairly significantly, almost 3,000 uh, um, residents. And so that translates into a, about $16,000 in additional community ed revenue um, each year. So, so if there are any questions, I'm certainly happy to answer those, but that, that's how it works. If you're a declining, in, uh, declining population district, you just don't say anything and you roll with uh, the, the amount that you have back when the census was done and you wait till the next time it's updated through the mm -hmm. census. But when you're growing, you want to capture mm -hmm. that revenue. Um, at least every, you know, every, every two, three years, you want to make that adjustment. So, so that's what we're doing tonight. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Kasmercheck. Um, with that, is there a motion to approve the school district population adjustment? So moved. Okay. Ms. Ellison, is there a second? Second. Dr. Newmaster? And is there any uh, discussion uh, with regard to this item? Seeing none, um, all those, uh, we're just gonna take a voice mo vote. All those in favor, say aye. 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 And uh, opposed, same sign. Okay, we have that approved. And then on to the last operational item, which is action on school board policies. Uh, we've got uh, five of them here, policy 514, bullying prevention policy, policy 615, testing accommodations, modifications and ex exemptions uh, for IEPs, section 504 plans and LEP students, policy 618, assessment of student achievement, policy 713, student activity accounting, and policy 806, crisis management uh, policy. Uh, these policies had their first reading last month, and uh, again, uh, just to reiterate, they were uh, reviewed and approved by the administration and the policy committee. Uh, with that, I'd like to just move to approve all of them in one motion. Uh, do I hear a motion to do that? I moved. Okay, Ms. Ellison, is there a second? Second. Okay, Ms. Beloyd, um, any discussion? Uh, Questions, comments, concerns? Okay, seeing none, we'll uh, approve these with a voice vote. All those in favor, say aye. 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 And those opposed, same sign. And they are approved. And we move on now to the um, uh, next item, which is board form for board members to um, provide uh, input uh, and uh, offer comments with regard to things that might be in of interest to the board or the general community. Anybody have anything at this point? Uh, Mr. Wilson. Yes, I would just like to point out uh, on behalf of the White Bear Lake Educational Foundation that their June golf tournament is close at hand, even though it's you know sort of mid-April, but uh, there are registration forms available and you may get any information and forms that you might like to 
received from Ms. Dawn Hank of the White Bear Lake Area Educational Foundation, 651-407-7675. Okay, thank you, Mr. Wilson. <laughs> and Stop grinning. Ms. Fahey, I <laughs> Sorry, I just, a phone number. I, I, <laughs> <laughs> I believe Sorry. you had your hand up. <laughs> I did have my hand up. Just a, um, a reminder, the third and final um, culturally responsive board leadership training um, through Equity Alliance Minnesota is Tuesday, April 16th from 5 to 8 p.m and um, a light meal is provided if you want to register for that. Okay, thank you. Any other items for board forum? Ms. Ellison. Um, on Saturday, March 23rd, I judged at the Metro Junior East History Day competition that was held at South Campus. And I was just looking through the results and of the students going to the state competition in May, 28 of them are projects from Central and Sunrise. So our White Bear kids did very well. Any other items? Okay, I do have one item. Uh, in my, uh, when I was flustered earlier at the beginning of the meeting, I meant, failed to mention, uh, as we customarily do, uh, the uh, generosity of the donors and uh, that give uh, various resources to the school district. And uh, once again, this month, like every other month, we have a list of folks that uh, have donated uh, money and, and various items to the district that are, were mentioned in the uh, consent agenda item. So I just wanted to point that out uh, and thank uh, the various individuals and, and parties for their generosity. With that, uh, I will entertain a motion to adjourn. Mr. Acting Chair, I move to adjourn. And I second that. We are adjourned. <laughs> <laughs> it is 8 <laughs>